Hey, welcome back, everybody. Day two. Today is going to spend pretty much exclusively on this. Nine designs. And hopefully Ray is going to lead us through that. Without... Ray, are you there? Ready to go? I don't see a mic sign for Ray yet. Yeah. He needs to have his mic turned on. You should have access. He's, he should be in a presenter mode now. He needs to just click the mic. Ray, do you see a microphone on top? You should be able to activate it. Some people can hear us. Good question. Maybe you can check. Anne Marie or Kurt, can you guys confirm that you can hear us from the boardroom? Well, Kim? Yes. I just wrote. Thank you. <clears throat> We're just trying to solve the issue of Ray's participation. He's joining remotely. So when he was listed in the participants, you could see that his microphone was grayed out. And then when he got moved up to presenters, his microphone vanished. Right, but as a presenter, he should be able to access the microphone. We have our team working. I trust you do. Every time we get the system down, Adobe or somebody changes the way the settings have to be to make it work. So you think that after three years of practice, this would be easy, but it's just as brand new as it was in 2020. For Adobe, too, you log in, you get set up in the meeting, and then it tells you you have to update. Oh, oh yeah, I know. That tells you Yeah. Yeah, Zoom at least makes you update before you can have it. Yeah. Right. I'll display the rest of the photos. On Earth Monday, I think I used four different platforms <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> yeah. And all of our teaching is covered. And we got very covered. <clears throat> yeah, UW uses Zoom. Noah uses Teams. Or no, um, me, Google Me. We use Teams. Now, yeah, Belinda Pacific Council uses what's it called? Is it something different? Yeah, I forget what it's called. It's just a totally different. And then, yeah, we also use Adobe. There's like the go to go to go to. <laughs> <laughs> It's a Noah product, isn't it? Is it? I think it is. Yeah. Was anybody in touch with Roy this morning? Yeah, he, he's he's on and was planning to present. I think we're just having sound issues. But he's not replying to me on Teams. 
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, you got you, right? Sorry, I, you were taking so long to start. I went out. I went off. So I just yeah. <laughs> no no sound issues. Just a, an absence issue. <laughs> I guess then whenever you're ready, Ray, get started. Yes, Secretary, can we bring please the presentation, uh, presentation nine? <clears throat> and Ray, I think you should have control. Okay, looks like we're at the final slide. Um, just a quick way to get to the thank you. Thanks. Okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person. Um, feeling a bit better today, but um, yeah, I'll probably be counting on Ian's help for some of the questions and some of the lit material in this presentation. Um, so this is the first time that we are presenting um, cost estimates to the SRB. This is a follow-up to our presentation in June, um, and the SRB expressed a, a desire to to see um, FIST designs with accompanying um, um, evaluations and cost estimates um, so that they could actually um, you know, review something that was more realistic to be implemented in times like now when we're when prices are low and, and, um, and the, the, the stock is down um, and we're not able to, to sample everything we want to sample. So this will be a little bit of a review, um, but with some additional information on um, preliminary costs um, um, evaluation of, of uh, potential designs. <clears throat> so some background, because uh, I know we have someone new today. Um, the FIS, the Fishery Independent Satellite Survey, is our most important source of data on Pacific halibut. Provides data for estimating weight and numbers per unit, per unit effort, indices of density and abundance, <coughs> excuse me, Pacific halibut which we use to estimate stock trends, stock distribution among regulatory areas and biological regions, and is an important input into the stock assessment. And the, the survey also provides biological data, <coughs> ages, weights, and so on, for use in the stock assessment. And annual FIS has been undertaken continuously since 1993, and the design was expanded during the 2011 to 2019 period to fill in gaps that hadn't previously been covered by the survey. That expanded grid um, is in orange, and that is the full 1,890 station um, FIS design from which we can subsample um, each year to, to um, have implemented designs. So it goes all from all the way from Northern California, outside San Francisco Bay, out to the Western Aleutians and the Bering Sea Shelf Edge. The FIS does not cover, um, only infre infrequently covers the Bering Sea. Um, shelf, um, which is covered by the NIMS Troll Survey, in, indicated in blue here. We also have um, data from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Troll Survey in Northern Sound. And we use a calibration between the gear types in order to create an index um, for each station um, based on um, the troll data. Our objectives and design layers. Uh, Primary objective is being to sample Pacific halibut for stock assessment and stock distribution estimation. And so um, that's sort of minimum science requirements in terms of station distribution, count, skates per station. So secondary objective, which is going to be focus of much of this presentation, is long-term revenue neutrality. Logistics and cost, operational feasibility, and cost revenue neutrality. And then we have tertiary objectives, minimizing our impact on the stock, assisting others to collect data, for example, agencies that we have data needs um, and any ad hoc decisions of the commission regarding the design. This is the timeline I presented in past years. It includes at the top in orange um, stakeholder input, which is um, an important part of the process. And we, we solicit that and receive that unsolicited throughout the, the year. Um, the design process begins following um, the annual meeting and um, covers the period from Mar March to, to May, um, and um, that gives us the 30-day window before the, the June SRB meeting, which we can present um, designs based on the scientific 
um, objective. Now, our intention is to, to modify this going forward. Um, even though we understand costs are very preliminary this early in the, in the picture, often based on you know, what we got last year or what we, some, some preliminary information from this the current year, our intention is in the future to give the scientific review board a, um, if necessary, a more realistic set of designs which account for cost estimates. So you'll have a chance to comment in the June meeting on um, potential designs that account for both the scientific objective and the revenue, long-term revenue and utility objective. For now, your first look at that is today. And, um, and another modification is that we intend to do that also at the um, work meeting with the commissioners in um, mid, early mid-September, which we did um, early this month. And then the commissioners make a decision, a formal decision um, at the interim meeting at the end of November, beginning of December, and then there may be adjustments to the survey later on. And, and there could be additional adjustments depending on revised cost estimates going right up until the, basically the implementation of the survey. So this is the design we presented to the SRB in June for 2024. We're going to focus on 2024. Today we, we have presented designs for 25 and 26 um, going forward to give some sort of um, sense of, of where the... the um, survey coverage is, is going in coming years, but those designs are, are um, really not, not relevant anymore because the, the, the likely implemented design is so, so different from um, this design and those will change accordingly. So our proposed design was to fish um, all the um, outside stations, except deep and shallow waters in two ways. So going down to Northern California, which hasn't been fished since 2017, and including other stations in Washington, Oregon that haven't been fished for several years. And the motivation for that was that the, the um, coefficient of variation for 2A was creeping up and we, had an, we were concerned about an increasing chance of bias due to these areas not having been sampled for so long. We had a randomized sampling design in 2B to through 3B, and then sampling um, areas in 4A and 4B, which either are key to getting um, the trend. They're, they're the areas with the highest density of fish, um, the most um, um, uh, uh, and most important for ensuring precise estimates, um, but also a couple of areas that we hadn't fished for a while. We had intended to fish the Western 4B um, last year, I think, and we weren't able to get um, reasonable bids for that, so we brought it back, and we added the southern, um, southeastern part of 4A because of um, um, uh, 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 assessed risk of, of increased bias due to that area not being sampled for so long. And we included all stations in 4CD. E edge rather optimistically, um, based on the, the changing distribution in 4CD and, and the need for information near the um, Russian border. This design, unfortunately, um, while projected to meet the data quality criteria, there's a low risk of biased abundance indices and stock distribution estimates in all areas with CVs within the target ranges. And we have a target, we've been using a target range of less than or equal to 15% for reg areas and less than or equal to 10% for biological regions and worldwide in order to maintain the quality of the estimates we've had in the past. But um, based on preliminary cost estimates, this design is not feasible. It would be projected at the time. Um, projected to lose $3.65 million. <clears throat> I'm getting a bit of feedback. Um, and I'm not sure if, if there's a microphone on or something, but um, it, I don't know if anyone else can hear it. It's like my own voice and horrible sound and um, distorted form coming back to me. Anyway. Um, sounds so fine here, right? Sounds fine here? Okay, I guess it's my computer. Um, Okay, um, so um, given the infeasibility of that design we presented to the SRB in June, um, designs accounting for the secondary objective um, were considered. The following designs account for the secondary objective of long-term revenue neutrality for the first to varying degrees, and cost projections were based on very preliminary values that already have been revised since we um, prepared this presentation. And um, I'll the preview that they've been revised in a, in a positive way, unless something else has changed since I last spoke with you, Ian. Um, it's looking a little more optimistic. Um, so 
we went through a sequence of designs where we removed um, parts of the FIS design and see and saw how that affected the projected costs. So this design here is the same station design as before, but we've optimized in terms of stations and skates. I mean, when I say it's the same design, it's the, it's the same spatial coverage, but we filled in the gaps in 2C and 2B, most of 2B, because those areas were projected to, to be revenue positive. So by adding stations there, we can make more revenue to, to offset some of the losses elsewhere. And, and going to a maximum number of skates, eight skates per station in 2C and 2B as well. So that saves us a chunk of money, but it's still not good. Um, this design, um, now we're moving through designs that remove one area at a time. Now we're dropping 4CDE, which at least has uh, quite extensive coverage by the NIMS troll survey. So we at least have a lot of data for, for that area, even if we're not sampling it ourselves. Um, and that saves a modest amount of money, but still a large loss. Uh, removing 2A, again, a, a modest saving. Um, removing 4B, down to minus $1.8 million. Removing 4A, minus $1.5 million. And then we have a version of that previous design, which takes um, 3B and 3A. Instead of using randomized design like we presented here, we choose the, the best, the least loss-making um, charter regions and see what impact that has. And that actually, um, results in, in quite a re reduction in cost. It's not because of this being a more efficient design that wasn't built in. We don't really know how much money would be saved by fishing stations um, all adjacent to each other rather than a randomized design, but the, the change in cost is because these are the least unprofitable parts of 3B and 3A. Now I'm going back to the randomized design again um, and knocking off 3B. It's a little worse than the previous one. Um, taking off 3A, and we get a design that's getting close to revenue neutral. Um, and so the final design is, is a version of this, which makes some further uh, efficiencies in the design, which will go. So that's design, which we'll go into. That's design eight. Um, again, same footprint of stations, but with additional efficiencies. And that was prelim preliminarily projected to have a net revenue of $8,000, basically zero as far as the our um, you know, uncertainty in these estimates goes. OK, so this was the revenue uh, neutral design that we um, presented to commissioners in um, earlier this month. And since then, um, uh, some revisions, some positive revisions in, in um, the cost values and maybe revenue values. Ian can, um, can uh, expand on that if necessary. But what will, is likely to lead us to be able to fish at least one Charter region in regulatory area 3A. So the Albatross region, which is somewhere around here in 3A, um, um, is now projected to be um, revenue positive. So that's that's something positive since since um, we did these. It's nice when things actually change for the better when you're generally looking at a large loss for what you want to do, and then um, you end up with this. Um, it's nice when you can add something back. So this is just a, a tabulation of what we had in the previous um, series of slides with the um, additional um, efficiencies design being the only one of those that was that was profitable, projected to be profitable. So the, it, the added efficiencies, what are they? What are, what are we planning to do to, to make this, change this from what was going to be a $380,000 deficit to uh, <coughs> uh, a um, essentially breaking even. So the proposals include um, not undertaking oceanographic monitoring. So we've been using CCAT um, water column profilers on our survey since about 2009, I think, extensively. And they give us um, information like dissolved oxygen, which has been quite useful for um, hypoxic years in, in IPHC regulatory 2A bottom temperature. So you know, when the warm blob was, was occurring um, several years ago, we were able to detect that. So it's been useful um, supplementary data, although we haven't used it in any um, formal um, parts of the um, modeling and assessment process. Um, but it complements our data, and it can help answer questions um, that commissioners and others have about why we saw changes or why we saw um, um, catch rates that, that we saw. So no oceanographic monitoring. 
NOAA Fisheries Troll Surveys will not be staffed by APHC. We usually have a sampler on um, the Bering Sea Troll Survey and I guess Solution Island and um, uh, um, and uh, Gulf of Alaska surveys. Um, reduce field staff on each vessel from two to one in two charter regions and only collecting basic biological information there. So length, weight, and sex will be collected. So this, this is going to be an information lost by having only um, one sampler. So no uh, genetic information. And um, uh, I, I guess uh, Ian can <laughs> remind me what else is, is, is going to be uh, um, um, not able to be collected. Oh, sorry. Odalis would be the big thing we lose. Oh, thank you. I don't know why I missed that. Yes, Odalis. Thank you. Okay. So additional changes were required still to, to the standard design and sample areas. So we were going to add another 13 stations in high density regions to increase revenue, and I believe we're no longer planning to do that. Um, it's not necessary to do that. Um, we're, and we're, but we are planning to allow for vessel captain stations. So that is in which vessel captains can choose to fish up to one third of their sets at a location that's optimal in terms of catch rates or revenue. So typically they're fishing three or four um, state grid stations a day. So one third of those, one out of three, and they can um, fish off the grid where they like. Um, but it, presumably in the vicinity of the stations they've already fished because there's additional cost in running to better ground. So it would, they would have the opportunity to, to pick a, 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 um, a, a more appealing um, part of the, of the vicinity of the stations in which they've been, which they've been assigned. And it's assumed um, that those stations will achieve 120% of the average catch rate of the usual fixed stations. And we did an analysis that supports that, um, that assumption. Right. Yeah. Would those captain stations be included in the index? <clears throat> or just so for purposes? We can include them in the modeling. They're fishing to our specifications. They're fishing um, still standard um, IPHC sets. They're not varying how they're doing the fishing. Um, they're just fishing off the grid. And we do this sometimes when there's been a mistake. You know, they've successfully fished a station, but it wasn't on the grid. We can still use those data. Um, so the intention is to use the data, but the way we get the index is we predict at the station locations themselves and get an average of those. So yeah, they will they will be informing that index, um, but we're not attempting to come up with some sort of weighted average based on on skipper stations and and, uh, and um, standard grid stations. Okay, uh, further efficiencies. The following assumptions regarding fist bait were made. Um, that there'll be a decrease in price of chum salmon bait of approximately 25% for 2023 due to, you know, I think my understanding is that prices have been unusually high and it's reasonable to assume that they're going to decline. Um, Ian can, um, let me know if this has been updated since, I don't remember. Um, that data, and that data from the current September bait comparison, which I guess is finished now, but I'm um, waiting, pending um, analysis, will be supportive of using pink salmon as bait and that peak salmon will comprise 25% of all fist bait um, used at 50%, uh, using, so used at 50% of the stations in 2C, which is where we undertook the bait comparison study. So we'll have some information that's, that, that's already um, letting us know whether we can reasonably use um, pink salmon um, based on uh, differences in catch rates and so on. Um, but I think we're, we're actually proceeding ahead with this, um, regardless of the analysis at this point, because of the cost saving and um, the design of, of randomizing um, pink and, and chum salmon will allow us to, to get at that difference within the FIS itself next year. Okay, so for this design, designs eight and nine in terms of station footprint, we projected coefficients of variation. Remember, we have a target range of less than or equal to 15% based on historical data quality, historical quality of estimates. And so what kind of CVs will we see with designs eight and nine? So of course we're fishing in 2B, 2C. Um, we get CVs that are, are really good, seven and 5%, which is comparable to recent years. Um, but in all other areas, except for CD, we would have the NIMS troll survey data. 
CVs would exceed the um, target range, and in some cases, 2A, 4A, and 4B would exceed the target range by quite a large amount. Um, excuse me. So for comparison, so for comparison, um, the um, estimated CV after the twenty after the twenty two fist, which was already partially reduced in some areas for B, we didn't get sample all the stations we'd wanted, for example. Um, was was um, below the threshold in 2B, 2C, 3A, and 4C, D, and 3B and 4A, um, a little bit above in um, 2A and 4B. And for, as, um, for biological region, um, we project CVs up to the 20 to 24 fists. Uh, within the target range of less than or equal to 10%, only in areas two where the bulk of the sampling is taking place, and coast wide, um, which is depending on data from area two. Um, all CVs are, except for area two, are worse than they were with a more extensive design in 2022. And we also projected the stock distribution uncertainty um, to give a sense to commissioners in particular. What impact this would have potentially on management decisions based on on where the stock is located among regulatory areas, and so these are 95% uh, intervals. We don't know what the stock distribution will be because we don't know what the 2024 catch rates will be, but the range of values here gives a sense of the uncertainty that we expect based on this 2024 um, reduced design. And so, in particular, 3A, the the range is very wide, from one fifth of the stock to to one third of the stock. Um, compared to quite a tight um, range of 23 to 29% after the 2022 FIST. So we're losing a um, fair amount of, of, um, of clarity in our, in our understanding of the, of the stock distribution, um, as well as um, the, the trends in, um, in the stock. So the implications of the reduced FIST in, 2020, FIST in 2024. Estimates from unsampled IPC regulators will have high levels of uncertainty and increasing risk of bias due to potential for unmonitored changes in abundance of stock distribution. Uncertainty and bias risk also increases for biological regions and coast-wide estimates. And this is a bunch of bullet points from Ian. I'll read them and he can, um, you can ask questions to him on these. But limited spatial design, such as design eight and nine, will result in much, much less information available for the annual stock assessment and management supporting calculations, such as stock distribution. The increased uncertainty in the index of abundance is likely to cause the assessment model to rely much more heavily on the commercial fishery catch per unit effort index. And given current variability and uncertainty in the magnitude of younger year classes, 2012 and younger, missing biological information in the core of the stock distribution, biological region three, makes it unlikely that the stock assessment will detect major change in year class abundance, either up or down. Although the basic stock assessment methods can remain unchanged, a much greater portion of the actual uncertainty and demographics will not be able to be quantified due to missing FIST data from such a large fraction of the Pacific Halibut stocks geographic range. That was the first part of the presentation. I'm, the, the next part is quite short, and I think I'll, I'll plow through um, and do that, and then we can circle back because I think this is the part you're going to have most um, questions about. Um, so this one is um, a modeling update, or what we hope will be a modeling update. At SRB, um, 21 scientific review board recommended that we explore other parameterizations of the space time model um, for modeling Pacific halibut. In particular, you recommended we look at use of mixture models or the Tweedy distribution. And what we did was look at the Tweedy distribution. Um, at that meeting, we noted that there was available, um, recently became available in the R endless software that I use. So the current delta gamma model accounts for the probability of zero catch and distribution non-zero catch rates through distinct model components connected by a common spatio-temporal correlation structure. A Bernoulli process for probability of zero and a gamma process for non-zero values. And covariates um, are included in both model components, increasing model complexity relative to alternative parameterizations. The Tweedy model as implemented in our inlet is a compound Poisson gamma model. Um, zeros and non-zeros are modeled together, and it therefore requires fewer parameters, particularly when covariates are included. 
We attempted to fit the Tweedy model to data from several IPHC regulatory areas. And here we compare common model parameter estimates and model runtimes with those from the Delta Gamma model for three areas where model convergence has been successful. I've tried um, other areas as well, and um, we're, we're starting anew with this, so the starting values aren't always good. So there's a bit of work to do to make sure all the models converge. Anyway, there's a lot in this in this table, but I'm going to summarize it. It's, it was in the in the um, document too. I'm going to summarize it. But in each case, so in each case, um, we have a measure of DIC, the model fit, and it's lower for the Tweedy model um, than it is for the um, current um, Delta Gamma model. Um, and so this model is is um, providing a better fit to the data overall. Um, further, but um, Despite that, the the um, or as well, um, anyway, as, in addition to that, the model is producing similar parameter estimates for shared parameters. So the spatial correlation parameters and the temporal correlation parameters are not really meaningfully changed between the model fits. So the model preserves our understanding of the spatial and, and temporal correlation structure that we had previously. It doesn't radically upend our um, our um, our understanding of of um, things based on a somewhat different model. Um, most excitingly for me is that the model runtimes are much improved. So this is the runtime of fitting an initial model, and this is in seconds. And so it's less than half for the 4A model we fitted. Um, it's substantially um, uh, faster for 3B, and um, even more so for, for 2C. Um, these are still not particularly burdensome times. Um, they're in seconds, so it's not. It's only a few minutes. But um, we also do model predictions and, and generate MCMC -MC samples for um, for um, uh, producing the, the final index um, to average those to, at each station. So in that case, the the, the benefits in terms of time are, are enormous. Um, and this is without even using um, you know, optimal starting values for the Tweedy model. So, um, in particular, we look at 2C, which um, the MC MC samples take 16 hours and took 16 hours and 47 minutes to to produce, but only 45 minutes for the Tweedy model. And all um, generation times for the Tweedy model in the vicinity of an hour, um, thereabouts. So that that's a, a real benefit. And so we're interested in this, if we have these benefits and the parameters still seem to be the same, more or less, um, uh, does it have an impact on our understanding of, of, the, of, the, um, of the trends in the final series that we get? And this is 4A time series. And basically, the, the overall trend is preserved. We have a little more, a uh, little less uncertainty in the Tweedy model and, and a little more year-to-year um, -year variability. But our basic understanding of what's going on is, is not changed, which you, I, which is what you want to see. It's what you hope to see because what's driving these things is the underlying data. It, it shouldn't be heavily model dependent. And for three B, basically it, exactly the same output, and likewise two C. So um, in summary, it shows great promise for future modeling. Um, the parameter. The values are close between the two models. The simpler model structure used leads to much faster processing times. Some convergence issues should be sorted, need to be sorted out, but we're optimistic um, we can do that because we had the same process when we first started fitting the, the current models. And um, there are some other outstanding modeling issues accounting for differences between troll and fiskier probabilities of zero catch. Um, we had two model components and we presented um, an analysis last year, I think, on a different way of. Of dealing with that, and it's I think I've got some thinking to do about how to, to replicate something like that in, in this framework, and generating the MCMC -MC values um, for model projections. We probably more information than you need, basket. But um, to do those, I I, um, I generate um, samples from the gamma distribution, and then apply uh, the probability of zero to each of those to create a bunch of zeros to get some realistic data. Um, it's not as obvious. And that, that's straightforward because the two model components, one has the probability of zero explicitly. Um, in this case, it's, it's um, a little more complicated. OK, so our recommendations are that you note the accompanying paper and both parts of the accompanying paper, one on the first design evaluation, accounting for secondary objectives, and, um, and um, the other on the, 
the preliminary um, modeling using the Tweedy model for first time. Okay, now happy to take questions with the support of people in the room. Um, Ray, maybe I could just offer a quick update on where we've gone since the, the design options you presented. Thank you. Yeah, so we've, as you probably gathered, this process was accelerated this year to be much earlier than we've ever tried to do this. So the first round of design options that we presented, we've always presented the science-based design options to you in June, and then we've generally waited until the fall when we had complete information from the survey to do the next round. The commissioners wanted to see this earlier in the summer. So the first round, we didn't, we still had survey vessels on the water. We didn't even know the categories in one of these areas yet. So we did that first round. Subsequently, the survey finished, and now the commission is pushing to make some decisions as early as next week. And so they wanted a second kind of design iteration. Some key things, as we were talking about before we started, we, we haven't yet even seen the end of this year's fishing season. So we don't know, we don't have any real outlook on what's going to happen with cost next year. So all of our projections at this point are can, are conditioned on the assumption that the price is going to get any worse than it is now. We're not we're not planning for any recovery of price. So you're buying your bait now. Well, that's partly why they have to do this early. So we were talking. I'm talking about price of fish sales, but we're also dealing with um, bait purchases as well. And that's the reason to try and get this done so early because they need to procure the bait now and get it um, while it's still on the market. As Ray mentioned, we do have decent preliminary estimates of the bait. We haven't put out the tender for bait purchase yet, but our fist team's been in contact with dealers and, and we, we have a pretty good idea of what the bait prices is. So the, the chum going down is is seems to be what's going on in the market right now. Uh, and integrating pink salmon in, which is something that we have been reluctant to do because we realized that the bait, based on our bait calibration in 2012, the baits fish differently in different areas. So we're gonna have an area specific calibration. And that's why we've resisted doing this previously, but because chum salmon last year were around $2.60 or $2.70 a pound, the next year we're looking at approximately $2 a pound for chum. Um, but pink salmon are about $1.30 a pound. So for any design that has a lot of fishing, there's a huge savings to be had for this other bait. So our, our plan is to, we're doing a bait calibration in Southeast Alaska right now, uh, where we're fishing both baits with a separator skate in between in a paired design uh, with two vessels. So we'll have a pretty solid calibration to add to our work from 2012. In that area and then in other areas, our plan for next year is to randomize bait selection at each station. So every vessel will carry both baits. We'll randomize the stations and basically do a calibration on the fly using the geostatistical model. So those, those are the assumptions going in. Also of note, because we're doing this process so early, we haven't yet seen the trend and biological data from this year's survey. So it's very difficult to speculate how this stock assessment is gonna project trend in stock next year, given that we don't even have this year's results yet. We're basically operating on what we, what we knew from last year. And so we, these, all of these projections are assuming a 5% decrease in landings from 2023 to 2024, which may or may not be reasonable. And we won't honestly know until we have all the ages processed so that we have the trend and age information to make a better projection of what the stock is going to be next year. Okay, so with that as the preface then, what the commissioners have asked us to do is to revisit the, um, the reduced design and with the new information that we have since we put this together in the midsummer, So we did that, and as Ray mentioned, we were able to um, get rid of the extra stations in Northern BC and Southeast Alaska, and um, also add back one charter region in 3A, which because of updated price sales information from this year, as well as the change in bait is now back to the revenue positive. So we would have I believe it would be a six charter region design if the commission decided to go with a totally revenue neutral design. The commissioners, what the commissioners asked us to do, and we're, we're in the process of putting this together for them for next week, is to provide a series of 
essentially plug and play modules. So they can, starting with this uh, uh, revenue neutral design, we will be giving them a list of uh, six or seven options that they can choose one or multiples of to add back to the design to the degree they can procure additional funding or rearrange and find ways to pay for it. And so the things that we are, we've, we've put back, we've put back one charter region in each regulatory area. The prices of those range from approximately $40,000 or $50,000 up to $150,000 or more, depending on which area farther west is more expensive. Uh, and then we've also provided options for um, putting staff on trawl survey vessels, which is paid for by our survey design, but it's kind of a separate piece. So they can see what the incremental cost of that is and make that decision whether they want to spend that money. And then the last piece is to add back our oceanographic uh, sample. So we have uh, sea cats, which we sample uh, temperature, depth, chlorophyll, and salinity. And those have to be calibrated every year. So we need to decide before the season whether we're going to pay to have those things shipped, calibrated, brought back, shipped to Alaska, and all that. And that's to the tune of, I think, around $100,000 to do that every year. And so we've, we're providing those as modular options. Um, we've had a lot of questions about, well, what if we just relax the CV assumption, the CV target of 15%? And what we've told them is in the long term, yes, we can evaluate designs that investigate how we maintain like if we wanted to just maintain the overall the cv of each regulatory area at 25 percent instead of 15 that would free us up some it actually doesn't change anything for this year because we are already at the point where we're not going to be meeting those, those targets except in the revenue positive areas which we wouldn't want to cut anyway because those are revenue positive areas so that's kind of a synopsis of where we're going we're, we're right in the middle of this right now the commission is we, producing a paper for them for their use next week. So we don't have a final draft of that in time for you, but we wanted to provide as much as we could for your evaluation this week. Is no survey an option for this year? So no survey would be a major financial loss to the commission because the, the limited design is revenue neutral and covers all of our fixed costs. So if we, we still have all the fixed costs of staff and some other fixed costs that would occur whether we put boats in the water. So the survey costs more. No survey costs more would be like paying for rent and not living in your apartment for a year. We, uh, yeah, we, we still have all the, the staff costs here, the headquarters costs and, and some additional fixed costs. That so that, that funds all this too? Not just survey just related. survey related operations, including things like our staff person on the trawl survey. So it's considered part of the survey effort. It seems like with the with the MSC and the, the work that was done on the CRPs propagate through and the simulation of the space time model that you've got all of the tools you would need to develop a, a really clear apples to apples analysis where you can take individual decisions with respect to the survey, like uh, having a region or changing dates, and make them go all the way through to what that would mean for, um, for the century of fishery performance in the MSC. And I I think that's going to be a, a real ethical challenge to, to do that. There's going to be a lot of decisions to make. But, but moving in that direction, I think, will provide some really useful tools. So you could, for example, say, given the same uh, rate of meeting our conservation objectives, how much would we have to reduce harvest given the evidence that we're taking that comes from? Any of these decisions with respect to the survey. And I think that that would be that would be you know kind of the, the gold standard goal for how how this can be presented to the commission in a way that really allows them to, to make decisions. 
because some of these decisions probably don't affect the overall CVs that much. And, you know, costs. Otherwise, you're trying to compare apples to oranges, right? Saving some money here, and on the other hand, there's some vague impact potentially on uncertainty. And that that doesn't really give them the tools they need to make a good a good decision in the, in the way it would if you said, "Okay, we can we can change uh, baits. That's going to save us this much money, and it means we're going to have to back off on our harvest by this many pounds in order to have the same probability of meeting conservation objectives." That, that would be really, I think, powerful for decision making as a, as a decision support. Just throwing that out there is kind of the gold standard. I'm understanding yeah. that, that that is not something that will be done by the next meeting or the meeting after, but represents the, the, the kind of decision making tool that you could create now that you have the MSC, you have the simulation model for this, and if you've got the ability of the stock assessment to. Essentially, you know, have uncertainty track through and see what that means. But I'm curious to get your your thoughts on that. Whether that is um, something that would be useful to to move toward, and what um, you can do to you know, push in that direction if it does. I, I I agree. I think it would be a great end goal, um, but there are a lot of decisions along the way. A lot of work to do. Understanding what we talked about yesterday, what's the effect on estimation error? How do you parameterize the MSC to to actually give you the good outcome? But I do like, and I think the commission would really like that sort of measure of reduction in the survey means this to the TCY. <clears throat> so yeah, it's something that I'll definitely. Yeah. The challenge there, though, is. Going back to some of the things from yesterday is like this: this stock is not a conservation <coughs> crisis. So, your probability of being below your twenty percent is like zero point zero zero one. So, there really is not going to be that that feedback. Well, the stock is a lot smaller yeah, on that metric, but there are other there are other objectives as well. Right? Yeah, there's the one that. They reacted to last year, which they would they would have to make a decision on that, which is the only other conservation objective. Yeah, I mean, there's near term objectives, and in the near term, most objectives would be that. Um, maybe though, introduce an objective like what's the probability of detecting further decline in the stock or something like that. Um, they may be interested in, but in long term objectives, I think that would be. Commission may be interested in um, more long term thinking of reductions in FIS design, you know, over the next 20, 30 years, if we go to this mode of, you know, missing these areas every other year, every two years, or something like that. And I, I think there's some interest in longer term objectives as well. And that, that is the only, the only real connection right, is the uncertainty. You've got to, Use the uncertainty, right? You've got to use the probability distribution to deal with these kinds of issues because the average is probably not going to be affected. Right. You're going to be biased, and so all you're doing is blowing up uncertainty. You know, you are starting from a point of fairly low uncertainty to begin with. So sure. it's not like this is a crisis. I don't think. I don't think. <clears throat> um, I can imagine a situation, however. If the stock does get in, in a low position, now you've got a survey that's not paying for itself. Right? You need the information. Yeah. You know, that, that's where it's going to get ugly. You need the information more than ever as you're trying to exactly navigate a never narrower trajectory. And, uh, yeah, to be fair, this, this has happened very rapidly. So 2021, we effectively had a pretty complete design. Uh, and it's really just over two years with double hit of decline in catch rate and big drop in price that we've we've run into this tight situation. There, there is one other issue beyond just conservation goals. We did get the question of the work meeting 
So what if we get the stock distribution wrong? What are the implications? And the, the commissioner suggested, and we agreed, that the, the biggest implication there is that there'll be quota, there'll be allocation to areas where the fish are not readily available, and therefore the fisher will have to spend a lot more energy trying to catch those fish if they can or not. So there's a fishery efficiency yeah. feedback yeah. in addition to conservation profitability. Profitability. And that's something that I don't think we're really capturing in the MSE performance metrics at the moment. So we have conservation metrics, we have variability. So we know how much things are going to change year to year in terms of TCY allocation. But that doesn't tell you how hard the fishery has to work to catch them. And so that is that's that's one implication that we're aware of that we don't have a, a good way to quantify easily right now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you can Get Sam his data, maybe he'll uh, reciprocate and give you a bioeconomic one. <laughs> and, and I mean, Ian makes a great point is the area specific objectives in the MSE are there, there are some objectives that the MSAB has worked on, but they're not as brought forward, I guess, as the coast wide objectives at this point in time. Um, and I think that's where the reduction in the FIST design is really going to have the biggest effects is on specific areas. Um, looking at coastwide objectives, I think is almost a moot point of this. If we're surveying the core of the stock, we have a pretty good idea of the trend. The assessment will do what it'll do, and we'll be navigating that that narrow road or whatever. But for someone in 4A or 4B that hasn't had a survey in three years, and we don't know if the stock's going up or down or what distribution is, that uncertainty begins to balloon. What is the effect? So. What I've been trying to think of is what are those area specific objectives that would be useful? Like, um, and, and I think Ray did some of this in his early work on, you know, bias and variability of reduced designs. He was looking at can we detect a change in and can we detect, it? will the index, will the survey detect a change in the index if it, if it does occur, you know, but also looking at what is the variability on the TCUI in that specific area? What's the reduction in the TCUI? What's the cost in terms of TCUI in a specific area? And that was some of those plots I was beginning to show yesterday in the presentation. I think the other thing to think about is that the, the CV projections that Rick showed were for 20. It, it's not like there's, you know, Right, sun on the horizon, and suddenly, given the stock status, right, suddenly, um, 2025, we'll be able to spread out again and sample all those areas. So, I think 2024 is still; those CVs are still coasting on some relatively recent, yeah, uh, surveys in a lot of those those areas. 2025 will not have the benefit. It's not like the CVs are going to sort of just linearly drift. I think they'll. And, and maybe Ray can correct me, but this is a question for Ray. But I, th I think they're likely to to balloon as you get further and further out from uh, the survey region. Yeah, um, thank, thanks, Olaf. And actually, uh, commissioners have requested projections out to 2026 um, in the absence of surveys in each area. So I've done those projections of, of CV. They don't balloon as much as, as I expected them to. Um, it is, does seem to be more. Linear. Um, I'm just trying to find that uh, document so I can give you a sense of um, of what these are like. There. And uh, there it is. Okay. No, nope, that's not it. How many documents? Are there? No, there we go. Okay. So by 2025, 20, all areas if there's no survey in 20 they asked specifically if there's no survey in 24 25 and 26 so it's worse than the situation presented today what would the cvs look like and in all areas in 2025 it'd be above 20 percent in three areas one area 2a would be 28 percent 4a 31 4b 39 percent by 2026 4b is out to 45 percent um, 4A and 2A are both above 30 percent, and everything else is above 25 percent. So yeah, they are still coasting somewhat on the on the last survey in 2022, and in the case of um, um, 4A, there's a little bit of contribution from the Bering Sea Troll Survey. 4CD 
would be a bit better. So yeah, so, they're they're growing and they're, they're growing um, um, to a point where you really don't have a lot of confidence in any estimates that you're getting out of this. It's probably worth noting that although we're we're having a struggle with the survey side, um, we it looks the prospects look good for retaining our comprehensive fishery sample. And so with regard, for example, with regard to fisher efficiency, just as the assessment will naturally rely more heavily on the CBV index, if the CD is large for the survey, the commissioners will have access to the trend in logbook catch rates as well. And so that is one supplementary source that could be used to help them make decisions about application among areas in places where we miss a survey for one, two, or three years. We'll still have that index of fishery efficiency through catch rate effort. And if it comes down to relying a lot more on that, I think there'll be a lot more work to do in terms of looking at hyperstability and yes. you know, whether, whether that is actually something we can lean on. Right. I don't think we know that yet because we haven't had to, right. right? Yep. And in the assessment model, we allow for uh, temporal variability and catchability. So there's a, there's a random walk on catchability to allow for that sort of thing. That won't be invoked if there's no data to argue with it. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's the danger there. Ray, it was great to see that the Tweety distribution seems like it will be a, a good, good addition there as opposed to the, uh, the hurdle model. Yeah, thanks, Olaf, and thanks for the for the push to, to look at that closely. Okay, well, um, so I guess we're being asked to comment on, I suppose, design nine with deficiencies. So in the short term, in the short term, and also some comments on longer term implications. I mean, one of the issues that Helen just mentioned this you know, is, is detecting changes in what this what the index would do. There's also magnitude issues. So if it's like things about distribution and local catch rates, you have to start modeling catch rates more deliberately. Especially if you think about economic implications. I'm wondering how relevant is to monitor the abundance compared to monitoring the life histories, because they often tell something about the, about the abundance. I think from the assessment side, it's critically important to have the age structure at the very least to go with the trend because the trend could be flat or downward and it's going to make a big difference whether that's trending with a lot of 12 year olds or a lot of 2005 year olds at this point. It's going to tell us a lot about the next three year projection. If we're still still fishing on an older year class, which is dying out fast versus fishing on a younger year class, which is still coming in. Yeah, and having information on the age structure, the whole distribution, you can approximate the mortality because that's the rate of decay in, in that distribution. So just the overall mortality, but that, that alone tells something about the abundance. So with these efficiencies no longer taking the limits, then for that year you wouldn't have age composition of the population, you just have age composition of the catch? No, so we, what, we, what we're proposing there would be in areas where we have at least two or three charter regions sampled, we would just take one charter region and not sample all these there. So we would still get a representative, we'd still get ages from each IPHC regulatory area. We would only invoke that when we had 
several charter regions to pick from. So that because the age just be a lower sampling rate. But to the degree that we miss an entire regulatory area, there's no any any age composition from there. And we're just we're, then we're just relying on the age composition that we see in the fishery to help us understand the relative strength of the weaknesses. Which you know, obviously gets messy because we get oh, assume that fishery sensitivity can shift in response to the things over time. So you have time very selectively in there? Yeah. Well, I mean, we get we get a little bit close, but not. So I think the general message seems to be in the very short term, it's not too much to worry about, but if any persistence of this yeah. is, is going to be a problem. And we had an example in 2020 during COVID, we had a big one that designed, not quite this small, but we really only sampled BC and up through the Central Gulf of Alaska. And it was not that big a deal. Yeah. The space time model of singleness is not a big deal. Exactly. It's, it's when they come down. Right. I think what, what Ray's showing is that once we're out a full year with no samples, the temporal correlation is not helping us at all. So we're the CBC just taken off after that. So I wonder, you know, if that can be presented to the, the commission in a way that's that makes it clear that yes, you know, it's possible to achieve revenue neutrality next year with a you know modest cost in terms of our ability to see where we're going. That's good scientific advice, but that also implies that. You don't want things to really go off the rails. You can possibly achieve revenue neutrality a year out unless something drastically changes, changes with fish prices or catch rates. And so the, the problem is not in the next year, it's in the it's in, it's in 2025. And we should be thinking about implications for 2025 because that's when we make our decision between achieving the quality objectives for the scientific advice and achieving revenue neutrality. We'll have to pick one. It's probably worth mentioning. We also put together a document for the commissioners, which listed 28 or 29 potential efficiencies that could be added to the survey. Everything from buying our own vessel, <laughs> running the survey off our own boat, to things like calibrating in a new bait. And so we've gone through all those and have prioritized basically every every place we think we can things up to try to soften this so that we're closer to being revenue neutral in a, a year or two. Some of these things we could put into place immediately and some of them are going to work out. You've gone through that process of essentially thinking outside the box, just looking at all of the various options. That's where some of these efficiencies that you see we've already are going to keep from with that exercise. Our, our top recommendation there, though, was to find supplementary funding for the survey so that in times when catch rates are low, which is by definition when the stock is low, we're not compromising the design. If anything, we could be skipping a year when the stock is high because right. there would be very little feedback there. So our, our top recommendation was to find ways to secure funding that would buffer us during this time. So we'll build any contingency fund when the stock is high. Yes, which has been the case in the past as well. We, we, we have done that in the past. But like right, like right now, the stock at an absolute scale, according to the model, is, is not that low. It might be this might be the your target. <laughs> if it's having trouble now, uh, maybe the baseline that was created when the stock was high is just a bit too much. Your license fees, business costs. Is that 
Dr. Antonius. Oh, we don't. I guess those are local like you know, DFO issues licenses. For Alaska, for BC, well, for for Alaska, we have both, right? So, so they have to buy a license. There's a tax. There's license. the tax. There's, there's a land tax. tax. Um, um, so there is no uh, like a annual cost associated, very minor cost associated for the after you invest. Major investor investment. Yeah. I guess another aspect of this that might be helpful for you all to comment on if you wanted to is that in, for the past couple of years, we've taken the approach of showing them the science design first and then working down to what's <clears throat> financially feasible so that they can at least see this is what it would take to get the 15% CVs. We've included all of 4CD and E because as you recall a couple of years ago, you recommended that we heavily monitor the, the leading edge of the stock under climate change and that, that is still our objective even though we realize we're unlikely to achieve that i think we, we we've been of the opinion that it's worthwhile to show them the full design and then work backwards from that but that does create some additional complexity and then another way to go would be to just show them the revenue neutral design and then work upward from there yeah Reestablish what the baseline here is. Right. I, mean, I, I think it's a powerful communication tool that we're expecting now because it, it shows what this looks like if you really achieve the stated objectives. And, and the contrast between that and its possible driven neutrality, I think, is really striking. I think, yeah, maybe, maybe useful business. And uh, this is what you say, this is what we decided we want. To get there, this is not anywhere close to revenue neutral. And so we need to make a decision about whether we bring in new revenue sources or we tell you know, what's our goals for, for uncertainty. You still have in period of two less than 10% sampling in area two in area two yeah. yeah if you so the original baseline is 15 percent in every area 15 percent or less in every area but some areas are bigger or smaller than others so we went on say a, a, a biomass a whole biomass weighted average going to be even the current reduced design is going to be pretty close problem to it's going to be less than 15 percent so having the, the coastwide one and i think you've been talking about this lately is do you need every area to be less than 15 percent even the, the coastwide comes out way less than Well, we do have quite a bit more flexibility. What we told them is that for assessment purposes, no, we don't need that. Yeah. We could certainly do an assessment with a CV of 20% or um, the missing biological data for entire areas and regions is problematic. Um, and then the missing stock distribution information when they get to that. Is also that's one that's hard to quantify especially without a management procedure in place. We don't actually know how stock distribution is necessarily going to be used. And I think things like before, like the ability to protect your costs. 
effect distribution shows. You can have a lot more surprises up in the CVs to 20%. The distribution is probably newer. Do you need to detect your classes in this fishery? They enter quite gradually. They're not going anywhere. Once it's not like they're salmon, you're going to miss them. A decade to harvest these things. You missed them by a year or two. It's not. It's going to have a fairly small impact overall. But I assume you present things like time series of distribution, just to see like how variable is distribution. Like you're not going to have suddenly a, you know, we've had some pretty consistent from... trends in distribution. So we've had a shift generally over a couple of decades. We've had a shift from west to east. Historically, you're totally right. We, we won't, wouldn't really care about individual year classes that much. The, the bulk of the fishery, historically, 80 to 85 percent of the fishery comes from fish that are 8 to 16 years old. And that's hardly changed over 100 years. But we're in kind of a unique situation right now where we have this 2005 year class and we had a big gap in recruitment. We have 2012 coming on behind. It's a seven year gap. It's been 50 years since we've seen a seven year gap. So we're kind of in a situation where we're relying much more heavily on a single year class in the next few years than we really have in a very long time. 2012 year classes are going to be the primary year class in the fishery until we see something coming behind it. And that's a bit unique compared to where we've been at least for 30 or 40 years. There's not much you can do. No, nothing we can do about it. Cross our fingers and hope for better environmental conditions. That's the first question you get at the annual meeting. Is there a new year class coming in? Right. <laughs> Every time. Yeah, and that's the same thing in Hake. You like uh, yeah, just this focus on what's the next year class, where right? it's like it's not it's not the way to manage a fishery like this one. Yeah. It's a way to manage a salmon fishery, but I don't recall seeing it. Yes, it's ever. What is the absolute exploitation fraction? It's hard to calculate with yeah. different fleets. And, you know, we used to have we used to have an exploitation rate. It's weird. So it's, yeah. just as a ballpark, we're around 200 million pounds of female spawning biomass. And the mortality this year uh, was 30, sorry, 36 or 38 million pounds. But remember, what get it, the fishery has a lot of immature females in it, and it's got a lot of males in it. That are in it. So it's an upper limit, like you're not. Yep. For a life history like halibut with an AM of 0.2, that's not a terribly high expectation. Yeah. Certainly not a hake. It's not, it's not a rockfish, but it's not a hake either. Hake exploitation rates are coming over. Six percent or Four year class, four awesome. large year classes of fishing on it. Huh? They have four large year classes they're fishing yeah. in. So they're a long way from they have 40 to specify the tree. I know. <laughs> okay, um, well, we've been at it for over an hour, maybe a time for coffee break. We're gonna take 15 minutes for coffee. Turn at 1045. That was the last presentation. So, so <laughs> the afternoon is apparently an open session on any topic.
I don't know if you guys have anything more you want to discuss about this. <laughs> Well, um, what I propose to do then is to have just an SRB session for working on uh, recommendations and things coming out of this while it's fresh. <clears throat> and I guess we'll have lunch, and then after lunch we'll do this open working session. So if anybody has anything they want to talk about. Can we just ask, Ray, did you have any recommended recommendations? For us, <laughs> I think Corey's not here. It's not really so yes, he is mute, but he got unmuted himself. Kim's been quiet too. Kim, do you have anything you want to raise on the fist while we have everybody here? We're not hearing Kim or Rick. On race presentation, just I think the basic noting the, the two parts of the presentation one about design and iteration and development, and the second on the tweet model. Kim, we didn't hear you if you if you were talking. Oh, okay. oh, there you are. Um, uh, no, I said that I really didn't have uh, anything on uh, on the fist per se right at this time. Okay, thanks. I mean, what, I guess I, I take that back. Given, I, I think that Ian's approach of presenting what is um, a gold standard in terms of uh, needs for sampling and data, and then bringing in this ancillary um, cost neutrality thing is, is a very effective way to communicate to the commission um about what the potential costs are but i mean at, at what point do you have to scare the hell out of them before they pony up and provide more money to get a survey done that would uh ad address uh the secretariat's needs you need a, a stock that's a bit smaller <laughs> And then we'll all be scared. <laughs> and then a big retrospective correction is where you've been overestimating the stock. <laughs> I mean that's that's something that I that I would and I'm thinking of adding something like that. Um So in the longer term, there's, there's catch implications of having higher CVs, which are mostly going to be related to fluctuations in, in TCEY. There's ways of assessing uh, the impacts or the scale of those changes and possibility for bias in the assessment, because you can simulate FIST data, you can analyze it using the existing assessment and see how things are changing. I, I think that's something that would definitely be worth 
maybe even a research request over the next uh, for the next session. And then there's ways of mitigating the impacts. So given what the assessment says, there's mit mitigation measures could be you know multi-year TACs where looking considering the trade-offs, you're probably going to have to go with a little bit lower average to get a little bit of stability in TAC if you want. And so that that can kind of compensate a bit for, for the instead of having TACs bouncing around annually, they're only going to adjust every couple of years. So the MSE can inform that kind of thing. Then how much yield do you need to give up to get certain amounts of stability? Those would be a lot more, like those would be some informative analyses. Uh, what we saw with the simulations that were done, looking at the expected values, there's nothing, <laughs> you don't get any effect. Um, and it might also be interesting to run some scenarios where the survey depends on the stock size, just to give the real implications, like if this persists, and you get worse survey information as the stock is smaller, that would be That might have rather than constant CV, then you're going to start seeing some real feedback <coughs> to, to yield and to risk. So I think it's going to probably take us till lunch to wordsmith some of those conditions. Right. So, uh, I guess you guys will come in at lunch, so we'll see you. Sorry. All right, thanks. Are we opening for everyone yeah. uh, lunch? The open working session. Okay. Thank you, Secretariat. Uh, can we now, uh, we'll now break for the SRB uh, drafting session for SRB members only, but we'll welcome everybody else uh, after the lunch break. We'll provide an update what time we'll be back online later. It will be provided on the screen. Um, it should. I think so. If it doesn't, just yeah. Kim, uh, Kim will stay online. Secretariat, if we can just uh, clear the room and keep only Secretariat members. Uh, sorry, uh, SRB member. Where's scissors from left hand? Would be kind of like, is this my hand or is this the scissors? I don't know. And we're back. <laughs> Top 10 list. The section of the agenda we're in is the <clears throat> open discussion on any topic. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about? The report has about 60 bullets, so I think we get lots to talk about when it comes to that. There's going to be quite a few requests in there, I think. Okay, well, hearing none, I think we and also not hearing any management supporting information. And we've already done a lot of drafting from the report. Why don't we just get to it? Over to you. Cool. Okay. Shall I share here? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm not seeing the share option. I think they need to make you. Secretary, could we please have all up? into a presenter mode.
we have also comment uh, from Anne Marie whether somebody can send her and her draft would you like to share with that? I have um, Kurt and Anne-Marie's uh, mailed off some of the data. Yeah, I'll take it on. You do have a link. Just send the link. That's true. Oh, yeah. I better do that. Yeah. Should I, uh, speaker here? Yes. Okay, Kurt and Anne-Marie, you should have a, a link in your inbox. Let's get ahead to the servers. Just make sure. So, Anne Marie, we've got these observer updates here for. Maria, are you okay with that? Uh, bullet target nine. Yes, thanks. Thanks. Paragraph eleven. Just a uh, five year plan, a bit of boilerplate there. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't make any specific comments on is that a document going to be called? Sure, it's got a name at the moment, but it's just going to be it's essentially the yeah. spreadsheet info one update in progress. <clears throat> The spreadsheet captured a lot of what we talked about last time around. Did a nice job with the average properties there. You can check with it as is. Okay, 15. Sometimes that happens. So 15 through 17 are just about the AI. Skunk. Maybe not a skunk. Maybe better than sort of that. Maybe better than the jackal. Yeah, what is it? Okay, so we get through uh, 17, 18. Okay. Didn't like that's where you're going. Yeah, I didn't. What do you want? We don't have, uh, we need a number here. Sure. 
Kind of big with the defined percentages and tolerances, but I think this has to do with. We did discuss this. Um, from what I recall, my thought on it was as long as the percentages are above some, right, it was above some uh, minimum thresholds. That there's not much you can really do about it. Just let it kind of float as long as it's above a threshold. So maybe means uh, money by missed above a defined threshold. Threshold extended percentage, I think. Hold on, that's not me. So, oh yeah, that's just me. So see where I have percentage highlighted there? Change that to threshold. Threshold relative to the And would you be looking for us to come back with some thresholds, potential thresholds, and support for those thresholds and tolerances based on some analysis? Yeah. Should we, should we request that, maybe? Yeah, I mean, the appropriate risk levels is really something that uh, a commission should weigh in on. It's not a scientific decision. <clears throat> right. Risk is. Yeah, we can run that through um, the commission as well as the MSAB before we see you all next. Okay. You know, some regions have very specifically defined acceptable levels for target levels of risk. U.S. Fishery Management Councils, uh, they, they set their preferred target level of risk, mm -hmm. so risk of overfishing mm -hmm. for species in the Atlantic, it's to five as <clears throat> four nine chance of overfishing. Right. So they can't go above 0.5 uh, right. by law uh, when the stock is in good shape, and that ramps down as the stock gets increasingly closer to the uh, status. That yeah, obviously took some time to develop. It seems like having that conversation. Does that little qualifier in the end help? I mean, what I wouldn't want to have happen is like go down a rabbit hole of getting super detailed about something really. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this is about, yeah. 
spatial maintaining spatial population structure. So yeah, I think that works. This actually reminds me of what I was thinking of yesterday about, about this. One is one option is to not include it in the objectives at all, since you don't really have a lot of control over it, but instead use it uh, in your exceptional circumstances. Because that's where it matters. If something happens there, then that's saying that your operating model and all of your performance metrics related to catch levels, for example, in biological regions could be out of whack. Whereas if you set an objective for it, that seems to raise expectations that somehow you can control the catch. Right. So now I'm not so sure. <laughs> but instead the objectives related to maintaining some catch in that region because if you maintain catch in that region you're right. maintaining biomass and you already have is, yeah you, you, you have biological region catch so yeah okay. yes sort it's of it's important to, to have an objective <clears throat> to maintain spatial complexity i had a lot of discussion about this when we first Use this idea of biological regions. In fact, that we, we felt like there was a conservation risk in having a situation where a management procedure took us to the point where we didn't have spawning biomass in what we've identified as a potentially meaningful biological region. I guess that that would be the point is to guard against some rogue management procedure that decides to fish out 3B for the benefit of 2B and right. 2C. I think this gets there, so it's above a defined yeah. threshold. Yeah. This is a limit, not a target. And the pass fail option is good there. It's, it's either either it's either working in any way or some pro. <laughs> okay. Um anyway, some some work on that, but we're wording it to make sure that it's not don't get the sense that it's too detailed. It's really just to avoid what an automated optimization might go into. I'm not sure that the commission necessarily agree that the spawning biomass was the sole trigger of harvest rate reductions. That we had a change in natural mortality, which led to a higher yield at F43 than they had seen the year before. And a lot of our discussion was actually focused around fishery performance. In fact, it might not be a conservation issue, but the fishery performance was liable to be reduced if they continued downward. Related. They certainly are. I'm just not sure that they will. <clears throat> just try something. The, when we had this discussion at the work meeting, the, the commission stated a lot of their concern was the difference in the new assessment, the advice coming from the new assessment suggesting a larger TCY, coastwide TCY, while the um, other indices kept declining and they felt that they should act in a precautionary manner. So that was in response to us asking if a, an additional objective would be useful related to spawning biomass. And they, they stated it wasn't really about spawning biomass. It was just we had concerns. We were we wanted to act conservatively when this change happened. And, um, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But, um, yeah, it wasn't all about spawning biomass. There was discussion of declining WPUE. There was discussion of declining CPUE, but they just felt like jumping to the new advice from the stock assessment was, they weren't quite ready for that. <laughs> and yeah. So, I just want to trigger, the, I just want to get this conversation out there mm -hmm. so that they, <laughs> Kind of recognize they're they're making these ad hoc decisions and ignoring their the objectives. 
or, or not ignoring them, but necessarily, but overriding them, possibly in response to noise or like you don't know. Yep. What one offer? Yeah. For, Go ahead. To say for me, the biggest issue with with that process is that it's not uh, well represented in any MSC scenario. Mm -hmm. So maybe. These ad hoc adjustments uh, limit the value of MS guidance from the MSA. Yeah. They're not scenarios that the MSA tests. So I think we took a slightly different angle at the same question, but we said, okay, what is your objective? We tried to define the objective for them, but instead, here's getting that conversation started. Is it related to a target? I'm not sure it would limit the value of assessment projections because I am actually able to provide them a projection with whatever catch they're planning for, but it definitely limits MSC. I think that is a really important point to make for. Them. Twenty nine. Going to have some more specifics about this down. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe this just needs within the MSA. I mean, I think that. This is related to what Alan was saying that you tried some uh, higher CVs and it turned out to be the, the high pound was too low. Yeah. Those. If it were here today, that's going to be a bit more trivial. Yeah, I think yeah, 29 makes perfect sense. <laughs> as well as that point about the bias there. Ray you know, right, right <clears> is often talking about. Sampling of the is a concern about bias emerging and not being detected. So, if there's a way to get that in there as well with those uh, C simulations. The, the last little part, and to investigate the potential emergence of bias and FIS estimates, I think, do you actually mean not? I mean, elsewhere might be to investigate the potential bias and FIS estimates, but this paragraph seems to be more like introducing the bias into the MSE evaluation rather than investigating the bias in the, because we'd have to put the bias of FIS estimates into the simulation. Exactly. So I think, you know, we're going to be ready to scale the yeah. potential you know, magnitude of that bias and then run some simulations where you're at kind of a higher plausible. There. So would it be better to um, uh, to delete to investigate the impact of the impact and just have it read representative of levels of uncertainty and potential emergence of bias in FIS something like that. <clears throat> Just go through bullets on okay. 30. We had some discussion that I think all of this is text that um, that David has put in 
sort of pre-filled in here. It's not coming from us. We had some discussion about whether you know, 97.5 and 2.5 are going to result in this exceptional circumstance being triggered too frequently. So that, that's a one in five chance for any of these in one particular year. It's two or more consecutive years that uh, goes down a lot, but we're, we've got a whole bunch of different indicators that have been able to fall outside of that for two consecutive years. So I don't know, we, we you know, couldn't do the math in our heads to see if this was going to be a, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a really sensitive indicator, you know, coming up with exceptional circumstances all the time. But, but maybe that's okay because the first thing that happens when this seems to be triggered is we talk about it. Yeah. So I think we talked in a circle and decided that this was no, fine for now. Okay. We try it. So yeah, that again should be familiar. Your the simulations that you're showing right now have those have distribution schemes in them, but masked. Is that still correct? Um, last round uh, we had five different potential distribution schemes. For these simulations, I chose one that was most um, similar to recent observations, just reduce the amount of time that it took to get these simulations done um, in hope that they would come up with some agreement. But it looks like here the recommendation is that if they're negotiating distribution independently, that's another that's a source of variability that we'd want to simulate in the MSC. You pick one of your one of your schemes at random each year. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. In the simulations. Mm -hmm. Or you could look at them yourself individually and see how much spread they create and right. um, particular ones. You could just say this is going to be okay. Like it's it's within an acceptable tolerance of what the range might end up being. I would think so. Mm -hmm. know better than we haven't seen it, but. Would you recommend doing it sort of that picking one at random every year over simulating five different ones and integrating all the results over those? Um, I think probably they'd probably be the same if you do enough simulations. <clears throat> right. The discussion behind this is that, you know, the Negotiating the distribution could take a number of years into the future, and that shouldn't hold up adopting that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because it is the TCY that really shows it. Mm -hmm. And that's almost a specific response to that. I guess I'm sorry, I folks who said that. Yeah. No, this is great. Anywhere without a. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's great. I think this is a great solution. Okay, 34. Okay, so Kim might want to chime in here. As people, if people just um, read these, and if you have comments, just it'll be Kim, all these blue ones. 35. Thirty-five. 
Seven. It's recognized the formal thing. <laughs> <laughs> Looks it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thirty-eight. It says two. I guess it's, it's related, I guess, to both staffing. Okay, 39. Yeah, the second recommendation is Get into some help. If you want things in a timely manner. Not that he's slow, it's just that there's a lot to do. Okay, 39. Forty. Forty-two. I don't know if you want to put that next to your left hand. Well, the office commences. Might be especially when thinking about survival estimates, to think about the ecosystem perspectives. Natural mortality largely comes from predation. We had some conversation this morning on the way over about how the how you know ecosystem based management you know often involves monitoring of uh, predation mortality for example uh, diet of the uh, species being, being uh, managed but there's a whole range of other sorts of studies that are not uh, part of the program at this point and it might be useful to discuss whether that is whether that is a I guess a, a thoughtful decision about priorities or whether that just kind of comes out of the the expertise and interests in the program right now. I guess it's, it's right. Uh, 43B, the word juveniles is in there. You're saying you get them down to age four and five is about as young as you see them, or? 
in our set in our set line survey. Yeah, we, we kind of shy away from the term juvenile because it usually means not yet mature. And that would include fish up to 12 years old, which have already been in the fishery for several years. Yeah, as, as, as we mentioned yesterday, we do have uh, samples from juvenile Pacific halibut that were collected in the NIMS trawl survey. So those are aged mostly, you know, two to five. Uh, and those samples are available there in the house. And in fact, um, I think, correct me, Andy, if I'm wrong, but I think the objective three of the MPRB grant is to process those samples and specifically address the issue that it's on B. So that's 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 something that is actually contemplated within our, within our research program already with, with samples that we already have in house. So 43B, if I just say... Continue. To collect and uh, process. Report. A little bit of clarity on this um, point will be appreciated. Yeah. Does this imply to expand our, our collection of genetic samples or? Not sure. Anna, do you want to comment on this one? Uh, well, it's more about like using them or browsing them to see everything, the stock structure, but estimate the kind of genetic diversity within the substances. And maybe in the future, kind of monitoring that similarly as the abundance. Yeah, you know, we've talked about uh, maintaining the geographic structure as being the objective, and I think this is a good way of, of getting at whether that structure is being maintained, not just a high level of proportions of, you know, uh, weight for unit effort in different regions, but actually in terms of the genetics. Mm -hmm. Did someone online have their good. microphone on? Getting some feedback. Is that good? On 45? Yep. Okay, 46. I'm not sure if Ian understands this. I didn't quite get what um, exactly is meant by density dependent recruitment dynamics. In section 2.2, .2, it's um, about maturity and fecundity in the research. Is this related to steepness assumptions or? Well, it's not the... related to possible assumptions about compensation or depensation. Mm -hmm. um, so like our stock recruit curve and things yeah. like that. You guys uh, estimate recruitment relationship or is that after the fact? We currently use a fixed value for steepness, 0.75 in the stock assessment. We've done an extensive look at that um, in the last, not in the 2022 full assessment so much, but in 2019, 2017, and 2015, we did a lot of work on steepness and determined that it wasn't estimable in, in these models, but that based on global meta-analyses, 0.75 was a reasonable value. The data suggests it's higher than that, that actually recruitment variability seems to be more driven by environmental conditions than the stock recruit function, but we were uncomfortable just assuming that, that it was density independent. 
that work was uncomfortable. It's yeah. Expensive. So <laughs> yeah. We've, we've, used, we've, used, we've used 0.75, um, but you know, we, we have done an extensive look at uh, the sensitivity to that value. It, it has very little effect on our estimate of the time series. It has a very large effect on our estimate of reference points and equilibrium conditions, which is why when Alan does the MSC analysis, he uses a much broader distribution. He's not assuming just a single value of steepness to, to calculate. So I, I guess I, I would look for some information about what you were looking for here, because I, I feel like we've done a lot on this topic and I'm not really sure where we would go next. Well, at least in this document eight, the, in that section, there was this idea that the reproductive capacity would be estimated through the length and age and um, recorded by length and age. And we would be replacing those not recruitment women. But there was no mention about the density effect at all. Uh, that may just be a an issue with the description because we we would include right now we assume that egg output is proportional to body weight mm -hmm. um, but what we would be doing we wouldn't be replacing the stock recruit function we would just be allowing for reproductive output to be a function of maturity fecundity skip spawning and, and that could vary with age and year depending on who found so we would actually be making things more flexible uh, not less flexible based on the the potential results from Collins' work it would still feed through that stock recruit relationship. Right. That would still be so it's <clears> eggs, <throat> eggs to recruit not spawners to regress, not spawning biomass. I don't know if this is captured here at another point, but we had also talked about the potential for depensatory stock recruit relationships. Yeah. Is that something that you've had previously? I'm sure the data don't support it because we haven't seen super low densities, but we're getting to the point where it's might be low. Well, we actually saw pretty low densities in the late 1970s, which produced some of the biggest tier classes we've ever seen, which is why I think why we, if we try to estimate steepness, it wants to be one, because it suggests that we're not fully capable of processing all the full range that we've seen producing all the foods. But it's also the compensatory or depensatory dynamics are not like time invariant that, that stocks can in some period of time be compensatory and in some other period depensatory. So they can undergo regime shifts, probably due to environmental and ecosystem conditions. So right now we assume that the log equilibrium recruitment is a function of the Pacific decay oscillation. We estimate the link parameter in two of the models, the two long time series models where we have enough data to do it, which allows for environment to basically change the scale of the stock recruit function. When it's in a positive phase, that value is substantially higher than when it's in a negative phase. Uh, we have not looked at PDO as an as informing steepness, as informing the shape of that relationship. Certainly possible. Uh, I guess I'm from first principles, we we would see it more likely affecting the scale rather than the shape. But I guess that's that's that is something we can investigate if that's what you're thinking of. You're kind of affecting productivity of the stock when you're doing that multiplier. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so you are kind of, it's more directed towards productivity, right? In that sense. But Our assumption is higher survival yeah. across the board, regardless right. of how many eggs yeah. we put out. So you're cranking the steepness up and down for the most part. So, but that doesn't, that's not really um, representing decompensation. You have to add a function. Absolutely. You, you have to yeah. have a more complicated model. So I guess if the focus really is on depensation, to the degree you can be a little more specific, it'd be really helpful for me to structure, to be able to come back with what you're looking for. And I could certainly explore depensation, a, a, a stock recruit function that includes a depensatory component. I would more 
So I think the way that I would do it, I mean, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't try to extract any information about it, but you could say, for example, and, and I'm not really one doing this, but in some set of robustness trials for the MSC, throw a compensatory recruitment relationship in there and say, does this procedure fail even if it's compensatory? Right? That way you don't have to assign probability to it. You know. Sort of a stress test for the larger procedures. Yeah. That kind of what we'll just do later. I don't generally like those stress tests because they, you don't know what happens if it fails. How likely is that? Exactly. Yeah. You're going to throw everything out just because it failed one stress test that you have no idea what the possibility is, but maybe you can just tune tune the procedure a little bit so it does a little bit better. I don't know. So would you want us to start with the assessment model and try to find something that's at least consistent with the available data? And then use that as the basis for the MSC test. I mean, I can imagine all I'd have to do is go down to the lowest biomass we've seen and have compensatory processes kick in right there. Yeah, we fit the data the same. Yeah, because we don't curve, have any information. Instead of the curve going it. like that, just make it go like right. that. Right? And then, and then we could use that inflection point as a, a yeah. stress test in the MSC. Sure. In fact, I think you can you can just add. Uh, a power parameter to the Ricker model to do that. The, the theta is called the theta Ricker. Ray also has a reparameterization of uh, uh, the Ricker where there's a, a parameter that is the, the SSB at which 50% of individuals can successfully mate, and that is essentially where the where that compensatory inflection mm -hmm. point happens. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can fit that to uh, the stock recruited output from the assessment model with uncertainty there. And it would sort of bound the plausible level at which that appears. The result might be very similar to sort of just cutting it off at the lowest observed because it has to be below there. Mm -hmm. and observe it that would give you more of a continuous approach to doing that rather than just that threshold below this process. So we could we can revise this bullet a little bit to say that the compensatory assumption stock. Uh, are we both typing the same time? The same thing? <laughs> okay. Just checking. That. So we think of the first sentence of 46. Clear. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, 47. Thank you. 
Yeah, I just may want to clarify and that both in the documentation as well as in the presentation yesterday, the um, it was it was described that the sampling that was conducted in 2022 uh, coastwide uh, was precisely to revise maturity algae, so that is expressing the uh, percent of uh, mature females uh, relative to age and length. So that's precisely the purpose of the sampling that was conducted coastwide. So the, in fact, the second sentence should read that the most expen more expensive sampling um, that was being conducted or that, that has just been conducted does address the SRB recommendation. Uh, Kim, did you have, is that what you meant on 47? Is there some other meaning there? Or? Oh, that's okay. fine. 48. Uh, Josep, does my edit there? Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thanks. All right, fifty two. Is roughly uh, agreeable today. <laughs> Fifty-four. Whatever number that is. Fifty-three. Fifty-three, I guess. Fifty five. Fifty bullets and fifty five. So, so I touched something. I've just changed. Wait, fifty five, all the bullets disappeared. So they did. All right, I was messing with this. Kim, are you editing? No, no, no. Nonus alligator. Are you working on the document? <laughs> <laughs> if anyone doesn't like one of these recommendations, <laughs> <laughs> you lost five at A, B, and C, I believe. And then uh, it's not below. And they were highlighted in blue. <laughs> it just disappeared. In the blue 
Just to confirm um, anybody online, if you are accessing the link I sent out, it's a live document. So any changes or changes will modify things. Uh, we lost a lot. You can go back a version. I think if you go bio, maybe you might be able to see versions. Or yeah, or undo. I, I can Yeah, I just tried to undo, and that didn't work. So I, um, oh, mine is back. So whoever did it, so I've done it. This is one of the agents of sending the link to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, hands off keyboards. <laughs> Except for me and Olaf. 55, and which are uh, the SRB recommended that. And then we have these three bullets. This is probably some justification, additional staff. Okay, there's a little bit of encouragement if you scroll down just a bit more in the last paragraph. This bullet. So that's just an encouragement too. Okay. Now onto this. Seven, eight, and fifty nine. The views aren't um, track changes for the things that we have. Say again, sorry. If they're not marked in track changes, there are things that we have. Check. Make our lives challenging, trying to <laughs> We just hit the return button and new bullets pop up. <laughs> this is our first attempt. But look at the speed. I know. Docs. Yeah, the speed for you guys. <laughs> There's <laughs> such a lead. <laughs> there, um, I downloaded the Word doc from that site, and they are tracked. These editions of these oh, paragraphs. Oh, I'm sure. They're true. just not in blue. The blue is, is to highlight. Okay, good. It says you added them at 6 p.m. today. <laughs> 6 p.m. today? Today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 59 we thought would raise a few hackles, but I guess it's okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I need. I think we just wanted to comment on the short term implications of the design. And 60 is the flip side of that. And then 60 is a bit more extensive looking at that more long term. Yeah. Is this sort of something you want the commission to take note of? Or 60? 59 and 60 are a poll. <clears throat> so maybe we just want to change the wording. So it's interesting. Recommended? Just request it's fine. It's just to get it there. The request of the commission note. It's just something a little bit more formal, sorry. Because they won't read that right. okay. Would the SRB like to clarify what sort of outputs they are looking for there? Or is that something that we should be deciding what, what are important outputs? I'm thinking about 59A. Sorry, I'm just digesting this right now. Um, okay. Is there something different on the screen? No. Oh, sorry. Okay, so that was yeah. So yeah, the, the, the background behind 59 is again, to remind them again, that 
target is 36% and they're above it. And the sky is not yet falling, but, uh, but 60 says it's going to 60 starts to prepare for that. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if you just scroll up and get 60 and some bullets. And I wonder if 60, we want to do some more bullets with 60, because I wonder if it really is. These guys fall at that point. It says it's predictable. Oh, 59? 60. Oh, sorry, 60. And it's also oh. noted. Scroll down to see the rest of Okay, so simulation test of assessment model outputs. So here, I would say, uh, for example, probability of decline, right? That's one of the uh, things. Estimated, say, SSB, but can you do like a, a stock status estimate of some kind? We do both. Okay, so I'll just say estimated, estimated stock abundance instead of stuff like that. Do you see why it's probably important? <clears throat> I, I, this bullet is about longer term. I'm just wondering, so we don't really have the ability to project what's going to be revenue neutral two years from now or three years from now. Would it be similarly helpful to just look at substantially reduced designs? It's kind of a worst, worst case scenario. I'm just, I'm worried they're going to get confused. I'll just say reduced. Yeah, I'm just worried they're going to get confused with this year's yeah. revenue neutral design versus something moving forward. And you should already be familiar with those designs because it's right. in the MSA. Maybe perhaps even reduced future designs, 2025 plus, or I, I forget whether that's clear already in this bullet. I guess it's not just 2025, it's include, including this this one, but moving forward beyond you know, just one year. Let me rephrase that as a question. How many years are you guys well, thinking about yeah, simulation? We were thinking yeah. something in the you, you three to five year range would probably be as much as you'd want to go for a tactical evaluation. Right. We're making decisions every year. That, that should give it plenty of time to go well off the rails and show them yeah. the scary implications of uh, doing this for multiple years in a row. Right. Something like this, 2025 to 2027 for Great. the assessment. And then yep. here for the MSE, you can look further. Yep. 2025 plus. Yeah. I mean, the MSE, you could say short term and long term. We have defined short term as four to 14 years. And
reasonable. Sorry, on a could using existing stock assessment models. I mean, you don't want us to just pick one. Does Ray talk about target CVs by regulatory area? Yeah, those targets are by regulatory area. Do we have a coast wide target? That, okay, because we've always we've case. always had such a low coast wide CV as a result of the, the targets by <clears throat> regulatory area. Well, I I want to. I, I think. Yeah, I think. Well, I was interested in coast wide. Yeah, well, currently the targets are by regulatory area. When you combine them on the coast wide, it's pretty small. Seven percent or something, with a car target, fifteen percent by regulatory area. Yeah. So what if you had a fifteen percent? You let the regulatory areas be whatever it takes to get a coast wide fifteen percent. Could think about it that way, or could think about it different regulatory area targets. So maybe a second bullet, bullet here, well. a third bullet, maybe just for giggles. So, so I, I guess just for history. The the fifteen percent target by regulatory area was not selected to feed the assessment. It was selected to satisfy stock distribution estimates that were consistent with the historical time series. So I, I don't disagree that this is those are useful targets at the coastwide level, but the, the reason that we have a fifteen percent target is because over the preceding decade we had averaged about fifteen percent regulatory area and that's what people that's the status quo that people wanted to maintain at that time it, it's certainly adequate at the coastwide level uh, but what i think what we're missing is the discussion of the use of stock distribution which would be compromised way before you got to a 30 percent coastwide cv we could just sample a tiny little bit of the core every year probably maintain 30 percent coastwide CV. yeah but we'd have nothing on stock distribution but if you had a procedure that let you do what you want with stock distribution or had a some, you know what I mean? If, if you had procedures that weren't totally dependent on your estimates of stock distribution. Um, I think it'd be worth it possibly that get out. away with the higher coastwide CV and much lower cost yeah i think it'd be worth spelling that out because to date they have always used stock distribution for at least some parts of the range in doing their allocation steps so that would be a change from the status quo okay. uh, one that would probably not be greeted equally by everybody in the process what is this i think under this bullet says related to above So yeah, related to 60 above is possibly fixed stock distribution schemes. Yeah. And so down here, if you wanted to keep, I guess I'm just trying to understand what this is coming from. If you wanted to keep target coastwide CVs of 15, 20, 25, 30%, you could add without regard to regulatory area or something to, to just let the design not care what the CV is at the regulatory area and see what the effect on the management outcomes is, then you'll get to see how important stock distribution is in that context and how these reduced designs of not ever surveying 4A and 4B, just everything goes off the rails in that area of the stock. I mean, I mean that, that could be a, a way forward. 
but whether or not that's meaningful to our actual process here where we are operating under target CVs at the regulatory area level. And Ray has been doing a lot of analyses related to maintaining those and looking at CVs by reg area. Yeah. And it's only one. Maybe we don't need to see them all. Just just one to see what the implications would be. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we could see what it produces and compare that to what the implied coast wide CV is from the other from B. B is going to have an implied coast wide. Right. Mm -hmm. This will be interesting because the, the two of the four models assessment models do fit region specific trend information. So the, those will actually those will blow up. Mm -hmm. So this will this will create some feedback. Maybe we'll see some activity here. Yeah. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Sixty-two, I think, overlaps a lot with sixty and sixty-one. Let's read it and see if see if it's reading. I almost feel like that's the preface to the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll do it. I don't know, we'll skunk. <laughs> we'll skunk this up. Okay, 64. Yeah, 64 was recommended. Was, uh, 63, so maybe, so maybe 64 goes up there as well. That's what, yeah, I was wondering. That could go either, but to your preference. <clears throat> 64 is kind of the general statement, and then 60 and 61 give some specifics. Too much about the water. Sixty six. So we have extensive monitoring of both age structure, length of age, and weighted age. Continue to be monitored? Yeah, continued monitoring. And maybe put weighted age in there as well. Sixty-seven. Yeah, sorry. Regarding the sixty-six, it, it's understood that to be monitored dirt is in the FIS. We should be specified. It's just not just the FIS, but also commercial data coming in biological data. I think within the FIS is probably. Because you know, there are some plus, like we talked about, there are some implications in the design that some some sampling might get missed. So, it actually, isn't in the uh, it's not actually in the FIS primary, secondary, or tertiary objectives. Uh, yeah, we we have biological data in there. So is that? Yeah, 
I think 66 could get confused. When I first read it, I said, if it's continued to be monitored, that it could mean in the fishery or the survey. So if you are, do want to be specific, it might be helpful if that is just to the FIS. Is this still under the heading of this design still? It's still under this, yeah. yeah. Sixty-seven. Let's see if it's gonna be a steel tool. No. <laughs> I won't use the DML DLM tool. Well, I, I mean that's what I want. Would this be data for if we didn't have even the fist? I mean it would be we still have a lot of data. Yeah, we still have a huge amount of information. Um I'm wondering if this point is more related to the reliance on fishery data as FIS is reduced. And if, if, I mean, just, yeah, I'm just wondering if going down the route of data poor stock assessments with Pacific Halib is the right direction, or if it's just worth at this point in time, noting that much more reliance on fishery data would happen. How would we take up that part of all the data stock assessments? Yeah, I think so. I would be curious too. I mean, we, we're already using informative priors, an infinitely informative prior on steepness, and an informed a meta analysis prior on natural brutality. I'm, I'm I'm not clear really what we would add at this point. Under a even even if we lost the survey entirely, I think we would still be relatively data rich compared to most assessments. And I don't know. I don't. I don't see any obvious places where we could add um, information from other stocks. That's a specific case. Do we keep this bullet? Well, I was like, you know, thinking other stocks so much, but for instance, if there's no surveys to keep the natural mortality estimates, there are life history invariants that are kind of natural mortality proxies that could be used. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you that without our survey, we'd like have a lack of collection of maturity data. We'd, we'd lose a lot of information about understanding the life history processes of Pacific Halibut. If you had none at all, like, it, but you are always going to have the data you have. Right, right. So but we would have a lack of understanding about geographical differences well, and things, things like that. time, yeah, and stuff like that. You know? Those don't really lend themselves to formative priors, right? Because those are very stock specific, and, and even time time and stock specific. But it would be be a source of information that may feed directly into the stock assessment, you know, trends and maturity or something like that. That that we would not have that information. But yeah, I agree with you. It's not it's not developing a prior, but it's a loss of potential information. Maybe this is less a recommendation to the, to the stock assessment team here than it is uh, a request that the council, council the commission note that this is the way we would be heading if, um, if we continue to skip surveys. And, and, yeah, and that, that's sort of the point I was making is like reducing the FIS survey puts more reliance on fishery data. And, you know, I think highlighting that to the commission and stakeholders is really important. It also compromises our biological monitoring. So right now we have an incredible um, time series of age structure and weighted age going all the way back you know, 100 years. And if we start to break that time series, you know, we rely on more constant, you know, more static assumptions, allowing for annual, annual monitoring of all these things. And I'll put it back in. <laughs> but 
I mean, I'm, you know, maybe this is not phrased in a way that's going to scare them. Maybe this suggests that we can use these other tools. And, I mean, I, I read that and it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just don't agree with any of those three bullets. Informative priors, life history invariance, or data limited methods. I think if we took the survey out entirely, we would still have a data rich assessment. We've got 100 years of catching years. We know a lot about this stock. You need to keep this bullet. I need to leave a lot of my bullets. <laughs> it, it does make it a lot easier for us to understand your meaning when commission asks us about them as well. So I appreciate the discussion. I think a lot of this comes out of just like making sure the commission understands the yeah. road they're heading down. Yes, exactly. That's, you know, that's half of that in the survey. Okay, 68. 68. Nice Speaking of team effort on this document, uh, speaking of maps, should this map be here? Should we replace that map with the uh, one we're actually? Are we endorsing any maps designs right now or commenting on? Okay, so this figure one map is kind of irrelevant. Full design. <laughs> So if, if there's any map to be in there, maybe we can replace it with something on it. Yeah, so I was that this morning. That's fine. Oh, I'll take a look. Not already. That's how it makes it Even the design nine is already obsolete. You might, you might just note that design nine as it evolves under the revised projections not include a map because it could be confusing because by the right, time so they see this we'll have already shown them another map that's that's updated and i don't think we even reference this figure so i think it's just rid of it oh, just really that. there are references to figure one but i figure those up for sure all right 68 That's a good one. 69. That's paragraph 30. Of my Dave is very good at you typically reference we'll track those well, perhaps the economics the sun is coming yes. out you know, whatever's out there. Okay. Um, this is pretty much repeated from the last report. So we'll want to check that there is a paragraph. Also requesting it. I think that what's being requested is what was 60 when we we're working on it. Yeah. And it might maybe phrasing it something similar or in you could use a block so it's uh 62 63 right now yeah and it, i don't think it's also requested it, I, I guess it sort of is requested there maybe a similarly requested paragraph whatever so We talked about this the last meeting and about the redundancy of it, and I think I agreed that you felt it was important to have it in this section as well. 
I see this request or recommendation as more on like missed surveys, whereas the other ones, the other previous paragraphs were more targeting CVs, not specific to missed. It's a slightly different request. I don't know if that's what you implied or meant, but yeah, we didn't actually mention. Well, we kind of were vague about what particular scenarios there are, but specifically this word uses skipped. Yeah. Seventy. Just kind of probably can split in here. So also somewhat redundant. Do we need it? Oh, we need that. I think it doesn't hurt to say it. Yeah. It's it's an important. Would it be useful in this section being a management supporting information to maybe and this is just suggestion on it again um the concept of switching more to fishery data than if the fist data is reduced the management and assessment becomes more reliant on fishery data i don't know if the srp even wants to comment on that or not but it seemed like we we're sort of heading that direction earlier i think we do and maybe the previous one doesn't quite capture that that's that we deleted it yeah, that, that was deleted. So I'm thinking under management supporting information, maybe that's where that would fit. Yeah. A statement like that. And following from this threshold, maybe that's a good spot. That might be hard to represent in 62A. Testing reduced this design impacts on assessment model outputs because you know the model of issues like the assessment. Yeah. Yeah. But but this both stock assessment and any use of stock distribution might have to rely more heavily on fishery data. And that's it. It's ridiculous. That is motion to adopt. Seventy-three. <laughs> so, Kimmy, are you still there? Like. Yes. Can we switch to the camera? Can you just expand that one? Yep. Since we've been so efficient, I think now is probably a good time to uh, tackle paragraph 73. Just to acknowledge the contributions of Dr. Scribner and his retirement from the SRB. I don't, I don't know where we would be without you. <laughs> no, probably in a pub. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed working with everybody. I was really looking forward to being out there and uh, sharing a cold one and uh, uh you know having one more opportunity to chat with everybody but uh i've really enjoyed it i've learned a ton uh and i uh, wish you all the best
you'll you'll be um, getting a notice from the SRB Alumni Society. <laughs> <laughs> Jewish. Does that meet on a regular basis? <laughs> yeah. Look, is there a new, is things. there a newsletter? Yeah, they will be. Mark's in charge of it. Each probably won't ever come up. Yeah, Kim. I just want to say thank you in particular from the secretary. It's been fantastic to have you on board. Um, we're going to ask you a personal question and get your size. I'm going to send something to you very shortly. So. Um, but just on behalf of everybody, and uh, Joseph in particular, I don't know if you want to say any words, but uh, yeah, thank you very much, Joseph. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate your efforts in, in guiding us and helping us out, so uh, very much appreciated. All right, likewise, again, I've, uh, you know, learned quite a bit uh, working with everybody out there. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. And with that, we'll... Uh... Motion to adopt the report. Yeah, I have to change the last paragraph from the 27th to the 26th. Yeah. And then we're good. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. For wow. Such That's efficient and, and agreeable uh, edits. I'm going to close. Thank you. I kind of like the Google Docs approach. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to like it. I think we did okay. Should we close the? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody online. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.